Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. Welcome, everyone, to a Science Thursday with Brookhaven National Lab. Uh, Science Thursday is our, our Q&A uh, session that we have every, uh, the third Thursday of every month. And it's hosted uh, by the Office of Educational Programs. My name is Aleida Perez, and I'm joined by my colleague, Diana Murphy, who will manage the Q&A sessions for today. Okay. Uh, so before I introduce our today's guest, uh, you can submit your questions uh, using the Q&A section, Q &A section at the bottom of your uh, Zoom screen. And if you have any difficulties uh, accessing video or any difficulties with audio, uh, you can use the chat feature to let our uh, wonderful IT person here, Ga uh, Gabe Lopez, let him know uh, how, what kind of problems you may have, okay? So I am so thrilled uh, that uh, uh, Dr. Michiko Minty is joining us today. She will, today we hope to talk about uh, particle accelerators. What are they? Uh, you know, why, they, why are they useful to research? Uh, and how they can impact or how they impact our life. As I said, I'm joined by uh, Dr. Michiko Minty. She's a physicist and the, the deputy head of the accelerator division and head of the accelerator operations at the Collider Accelerator Department here at Brookhaven National Lab uh, in Long Island, New York. Michiko is also an APS fellow, and she is an author uh, together with Frank Zimmerman, a leading accelerator physicist at CERN. Uh, they wrote a textbook that is used in, 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 in colleges and schools called Measurement and Control of Charged Particle Beam. Welcome, Michiko. It's a pleasure having you here today. How are you doing? Fine, thank you. Thank you. Oh, it's so great. So I think, you know, to get our conversation started uh, and to get us going, um, can you tell us uh, a little, can you tell us, um, in, you know, in, in some ways that we can all understand a simple way, what it is, what is a particle accelerator? What is that? Sure, sure. So particle accelerators, are devices that are used to generate beams of charged particles. These can be electrons, protons, or at, at our big accelerator here, uh, heavier ions. And they're used in many applications, uh, such as in basic energy science or in applied science. So the concept of um, high energy particle accelerators is often attributable to Ernest Lawrence, who in the late 1920s built a so-called cyclotron which is uh, a device that accelerates particles in a circular configuration uh, confined by magnets and acceleration accelerated by application of a external radio frequency fields. Since then, particle accelerators come in all shapes and forms. They can be linear or circular. Uh, some people, uh, if they remember the old big clunky TVs might have known or not that mm -hmm. inside these big TVs, they had a small particle accelerator in the form of a cathode ray tube. Inside there, there was an electron gun and a phosphorescent screen. So when the electrons were deflected onto the screen, uh, the TV image was created. Another example of an accelerator is in the dental x-ray machine, which we're all familiar with. And it works in a similar way as the cathode tube making an x-ray, a lot of x-rays to image your teeth. That's actually very cool that you mentioned the, 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 the synchrotron. So if I remember from my high school physics like 300 years ago, and my college is it too, that synchrotron that it was, Ernest Lerner was a, like a tabletop, right? It was not a, it was not a yeah. large, it was not the a small, large, the small one. Done at Berkeley. Yes, I wanted to build one and I, you know, like in my days and was advised not to. So that, you know, in the application, you know, when you think about the old TVs, it, as, it's a particle accelerator that it's used to create an image. Um, but at the BNL, if we can see in my back here, you know, we have uh, a nice image of the circular and also linear accelerators that we have. At BNL, the accelerators that we have are, are, are more complex than just the cathode and ray tube, but fundamentally, they have the same goal, I think. Is it fair to say that? Well, yes and no. 
Um, our two largest facilities at Brookhaven National Lab do use particle beams to image structures on very small dimensional scales, but in different ways. But at Brookhaven, we also have other accelerator facilities with different scientific missions, such as the use of accelerators to produce rare isotopes as needed for cancer uh, diagnostics or treatment, mm -hmm. or the use of accelerators to understand the effects of space radiation for future missions to outer space. That's you know how it supports this, the supports all the sciences, all the type of research. That's actually very, very, very feel like you know an, a good application benefit of the technology. Um, like I said, we have an image here, BNL, and I, I, I will say that uh, not all accelerators are the same, right? So in BNL, we have uh, accelerators that, are, that, that accelerate electrons, for example, and others that use accelerate protons and heavy ion ac accelerators, such as RIC. So what is the difference between the two of them? Okay, so at the Relativistic uh, Heavy Ion Collider, that's the big machine that's in the upper left behind your image there that you can see. It's actually, it actually has about a two and a half mile uh, 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 circumference. It's very large. You can see it uh, if you fly over Long Island and you can even see it through satellite images, weather maps. Uh, the relativistic heavy ion collider uh, accelerates particles to relativistic speeds, which you may remember uh, from High school science means that that's nearly uh, the speed of light. So for example, the particles that we uh, generate and accelerate in the relativistic heavy ion collider, they actually travel around that two and a half mile circumference about 80,000 times per second. So that's what we mean by relativistic. Mm -hmm. And the heavy ions, that refers to the type of particles. And then the collider refers to the fact that we actually have in that, that ring that actually consists of two separate rings. You can see in, behind, in my background, the two separate rings, if I move over, those are the uh, cryostats. And so you have one beam uh, uh, circulating clockwise, the other beam circulating counterclockwise, and they are brought into collision at up to six uh, points in the collider. So that's the meaning of the relativistic heavy ion collider. And what do we do with that? Uh, we use that, the collider to explore the fundamental forces of nature. So with the two counter-rotating beams, we make um, collisions. So sometimes people have heard the collider referred to as atom smashing. Yes. Um, but what we do is we study the inner forces uh, between quarks and gluons contained within the nuclei of the colliding atoms. So for this, we like to accelerate heavy ion atoms, which contain lots of protons and neutrons, within which are the quarks and uh, gluons of interest. We also uh, collide protons, which are polarized, meaning that the internal magnetic moments inside of the protons have been carefully aligned to study how it is that protons have any magnetic moment at all. That's a big mystery in science right now. Mm -hmm. So we would like to understand the distribution of the magnetism within the protons. So at RIC, we collide both protons or heavy ions with multiple different species. At NSLS-2, the situation is rather different. Uh, the NSLS-2 stands for National Synchrotron Light Source. It's a second generation for Brookhaven National Lab. That's why it has the two. And that's pictured uh, right behind a LIDAR there. Uh, it's the big white ring that you see in the image there. And uh, it generates light. Uh, so these so-called light sources, of which there are, there are tens of thousands around the world nowadays, uh, scientists use the very focused and coherent light that is emitted by the accelerated electrons. So it's a fact of nature that if you accelerate electrons in a circle, they will emit photons tangential to their trajectory. So it's a very multidisciplinary applications at NSLS-2 these days. So in the early days of these light sources, well, it's actually kind of interesting as, as accelerator physics and science pushed to higher energies, it turned out that the radiated light was a hindrance uh, to accelerate electrons using circular accelerators because the energy was radiated away in the form of light. 
Well, this problem turned out to be very, uh, was, it was turned around and people started using this very intense light in lots of different fields. For example, in the early days, uh, the funding for these kind of, this kind of science came from the auto industry. Turns out these beams of very localized uh, light uh, can be used to very um, precisely deposit heat onto motor parts. And so they, the auto industry was very interested in testing uh, their motor parts. Also, the um, what we now call information technology uh, branches of science were interested in this because these uh, very small, tiny, intense light beams are so powerful that they were used to um, etch printed circuit boards and therefore they could do that and reduce the size of computer chips and therefore the size of computers. Mm -hmm. So that was the, those are the early days of the light sources where the electrons are accelerated, they emit light and they're used for science. More recently, like starting in about the 1980s, uh, the field of light sources really boomed. And that was a result of collaborations that were established between national laboratories, such as Brookhaven and academia universities, specifically biology and later medicine. And since then, the use of light sources has included imaging of all sorts of uh, samples, including mapping of DNA, proteins, and very recently at Brookhaven National Lab, the light source has been used in the studies of the inner structures of the COVID molecules. Yes, that is true. Very uh, important work on various proteins as structures for the, for the, for the SARS virus. Amishiko, there's a question on sure. the Q&A. Uh, it's asking, is the, US on, is the U.S. only country with, is the only, is the only country with a synchrotron light source? That's a good question. The answer is that there are, I would say up to about 30,000 synchrotron light sources nowadays. Uh, 30 years ago, we were talking hundreds, but the fact that these accelerators are cost effective and produce such a wealth of science has really allowed this technology to flourish around the world, including in a lot of uh, third world countries. Mm -hmm. which I find very interesting, which uh, is, of course, good for their economy and their science um, advancement. Yeah, and I, and I would like to say that in the Department of Energy Complex, I think we have five light sources. Uh, there's one here in Chicago. There's one at Argonne National Lab. There's mm -hmm. one at Berkeley National Lab. And, and two um, at SLAC, right? Stanford? Oh, yes. There's uh, the SPEAR. And, and, and I should say that the light sources I've been talking about since this is what we have here are circular. There's a new branch of science uh, that's actually using uh, uh, linear electron accelerators. Uh, one hears of this, sometimes it's referred to as free electron lasers. Mm -hmm. And that is allowing one to establish even higher energies that you can um, achieve uh, at the, the circular machines because of the fact that so much energy is radiated away. But there was a great question. I want to do add, add one point uh, concerning the collider, the relativistic heavy ion collider. We used to have um, three big high energy facilities in the United States. And um, that one was at Stanford. That was a linear collider. That project ended in the mid 90s. And there was the Tevatron at Fermilab National Laboratory in Batavia, Illinois. And that was a colliding beam facility. And here we have now the relativistic heavy ion collider. And it's uh, the only uh, collider in the United States, in the Americas so far, even, uh, that's presently in operation. And, they and um, concerning the polarized protons that we generate and do science with, it's the only polarized uh, beam collider in the world at the moment. Mm -hmm. That is true, and, it's, and the fact that we have it here at BNL, right? Uh, it, it's even greater. Yeah. Also, there's another question in the Q&A. Is there research done with the particle accelerators related to energy sustainability? Yes, definitely. Uh, so uh, especially at the, uh, the light sources. So the light sources can be used to, um, because, okay, I'll, there, there's a couple of features that mm -hmm. uh, make the light sources like NSLS2 so interesting. Uh, one is that uh, the, wavelength of the emitted light 
is uh, the wavelengths are very short. Mm -hmm. So on the order of um, tens to 100 or even smaller nanometers. And so that starts to uh, approach the size of atoms. So that means that using these light beams, you can start to resolve the inner structure on those time scales. Um, so that and the other interesting feature is that the light that it's emitted, it's very coherent, which means that it has not a big spread of frequencies, but it's very, very uh, collimated, much like a laser. Lasers come at specific wavelengths. These light sources are the same way. And so that allows you to do very high resolution measurements. So what do scientists do? Some scientists, that there's lots of science, of course, being done at the light source, but um, one thing they can do is uh, study the internal structure of, of molecules, including how chemical reactions uh, transform and, and try to understand how that is. And with that understanding, then work to, uh, to manipulate it and control it. For example, in energy storage. Mm -hmm. Yes, so there's a lot of research going on there. Uh, there's another two questions. I think they're very, very cool too. So they're all related, that both questions are related to the Large Hydron Collider or the LHC. So the first question that is asking, is the LHC the most powerful particle accelerator? And then uh, following that, why is the LHC so famous if there are so many accelerators? Ah, okay. So yeah, th those are related. The yes. LHC, the Large Hadron Collider, is in fact the most high energy particle collider that's ever been built. So it has, um, uh, generally the larger the accelerator, the higher the energy it can go. Mm -hmm. So I mentioned that ours is two and a half miles in circumference, that's 3.8 kilometers. The LHC is about 27 kilometers. And so they can reach, uh, for those people who understand these units, uh, tens of TeV of energy. So they can get to much, much higher energy than, than, than this, uh, this one. So we have two large colliders in the world, the LHC, which is at the France-Swiss border, and ours here at Brookhaven. Um, so of course we do different kinds of science, um, but they're to some degree complementary. Um, but at the LHC, what makes it famous is, and it was really in pursuit of the, um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, the Higgs boson? Uh, yes, but they call oh, discovery science, the discovery science. So we're mm -hmm. doing precision science uh, to a large degree here at Brookhaven. And because of the new reach in the energy frontier that was made possible at the Large Hadron Collider, they can do discovery science, making collisions at energies that nobody has ever done before. And it was designed specifically for that and specifically to look for the creation of what's called uh, the Higgs boson. And that was successfully achieved. And I do want to make a point for American science. I've been around the world, but um, at working at different accelerators. But for those who may remember, in the 80s, the Americans had pursued the building of what then was called the superconducting super collider. And that was to be built in Waco or Waco, Texas. Mm -hmm. And it is just kills me that we uh, it went so far they the tunnel was largely built and all this and uh the cost overruns or whatever caused it to um stop being constructed but i feel like we could have been doing that science yes but, it's yeah so now the europeans they decided it was a good idea you know the cern uh, institute over there they uh, are a consortium of lots of countries and they decided that that's where they wanted to invest their um, research money mm -hmm. in the field of accelerators. And so they got to do the science that I was hoping that we would have had done. Yeah. And we would have finished it earlier because we started so much earlier, but, yeah. but um, that's sometimes how the science, and politics the science is done. Yeah, yes. it's good that they're doing it then. And sometimes it's just how science and politics in, you know, collide from time to time. Yeah, well, Brookhaven, we have actually a lot of people that are involved in the experiments at, at um, the Large Hadron Collider. Mm -hmm. so this is a good question. Yeah, nowadays it's all collaborative. These mm -hmm. accelerators are so expensive to mm -hmm. build that we have contributed the United States huge amounts of, of detectors and such. And as in exchange, we have access to the science. 
Yeah, it's like, um, it's a question on the chat. Is the BNL involved in the Large Hadron Collider? We do, we are one of the centers, right? First year yes, center. That's right. So in particular, we're involved in, uh, you know, the LHC has four high energy physics experiments. One is called ATLAS. And we have, are making large contributions in the data analysis and actually the detector development for the ATLAS. And our, we have a superconducting magnet division here at Brookhaven National Lab, and they are developing the world's highest magnetic field magnets that will eventually go into the upgrade of the Large Hadron mm -hmm. Collider. So we have a lot of collaboration. We do. And that's how science is done these days. You can't do it alone. Uh, there's another, two, uh, another set of questions, Michiko. Uh, one of them is asking, can you repeat what a particle accelerator is and why is it is why it is important. Okay, the particle accelerator allows you to take elementary particles, be it electrons, protons, or even heavy ions, those are the kind that we accelerate here, and generate very high energies through the use of, uh, well, uh, the, there are lots of pieces to uh, an accelerator, but uh, sort of the two, three primary ones that we'd say are magnets, radio frequency cavities, as we call them. That's what provides the voltage gradient to accelerate, and the vacuum systems uh, in which the particles are going. And so the, the point of the accelerator is to get these particles to high energy. And then you can use them to, uh, for example, image uh, target material. So you can, the uh, particles can collide on a target and you can create, you know, the famous energy equals uh, MC squared Einstein's equation. You can create other forms of matter and mm -hmm. see that all the time at the relativistic heavy ion collider. Um, at NSLS2, you accelerate the electrons and there's this other phenomenon that happens. The electrons are going in a circle and they radiate light. And so you use the light for the science and, mm -hmm. the, and the various applications, medical, I mentioned, uh, what did I mention? The in auto industry, computers, yeah. and now medical, biological. Cool. So there are lots of applications there. Um, we use accelerators also to uh, make, through this uh, deposition of energy by the accelerated beams on targets, we use that to make uh, isotopes, mm -hmm. very specific kind of isotopes by very carefully uh, selecting the energy of, of the beams um, to make specific isotopes that um, we then package, process, and in collaboration with other mm -hmm. labs, eventually send actually to um, um, hospitals around the world to treat patients. Um, and to imaging too, right? Uh, for and for imaging, imaging as well, no. that's right. Mm, that's right. Uh, I didn't mention, uh, we have the NASA Space Radiation Laboratory Facility, which also uses beams uh, produced by I, our accelerator injector complex. Mm -hmm. And they are doing interesting uh, studies, uh, for example, taking uh, electronics and then exposing it to the radiation generated by the accelerated particle beams mm -hmm. and understanding what the effect of it, that is on the electronics. That's the same effect that um, you expect to see out in outer space due to naturally occurring cosmic rays. Yeah. So the question is how long would these uh, electronics that you need to, to explore outer space last under the influence of cosmic rays? So we can make lots of cosmic rays um, at, with accelerators and then use that to test and then predict how long these things will last. Correct. So we and also uh, you know, to take it a step further to understand the effectiveness of a clothing even for people mm -hmm. who will eventually go to outer space. You know, does it protect you and, and study? So it's a different research field than mine, but um, it's a very interesting one because it's so forward looking. Yeah, it is. And, and so uh, our, our facility is unique in that way. Uh, there's another set of questions, uh, Michiko, and I'm going to kind of step out of the, the our usual pattern that we do like you know and i'm gonna there's a question about you as a scientist is asking says hello how did this machine minty be, became a scientist what factors contributed to this decision and what can one do to accomplish such profession oh thank you well to be honest i had a quite uh non-linear career to be where I am now. Mm -hmm. uh, I, my um, undergraduate was in German literature and 
mathematics. So the, the, both of those uh, somehow came very easy. And I actually had no exposure to physics until I was um, and it was called an exchange student. I went to Germany as an exchange student. And in the evenings over dinner, you know, we collected in the dorms and uh, it was quite clear that this one group of people that I really enjoyed being with were just ecstatically discussing physics questions every night. And they were so enthusiastic about it. I went back to the United States after my year and I actually, I took, um, science or physics for non-science majors, where you memorize formulas, you apply it, you know, light and prisms and all this. And I just was fascinated. It's like, I want to know how this works. Um, and so I then moved on and took the rest of the, you know, started on a physics path. And I was a little bit lucky um, because um, I uh, was fortunate to have some very, good professors. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, there was a, a, a small cyclotron facility. And a professor after after one semester, he actually offered me a job. He was new. And so he was looking for grad or students to work with him. And I turned him down because I had just started uh, accepted teaching for the math department, but it planted a seed. So a year and a half later, once I finished my math, de math degree and I, my commitments there, I went to the cyclotron and I actually, I don't know anybody who's done this, but I went and talked to all these professors and asked them what they were doing and, um, and said, I want, I want to do something. But instead of looking for a job, I was more like looking for them and finding out what was interesting. So I found something that works, worked. And I ended up uh, working uh, for my entire graduate school career at the cyclotron. And that was good because um, I could do work on my thesis, get tuition reduction, mm -hmm. and um, it was pretty stable. And uh, then there was a little bit of luck. I, um, I, I studied a, the rare field, which is this polarization that I mentioned at, at the Relativistic Avion Collider. And it turned out at Stanford, they wanted to have polarized beams. So just maybe lucky, good timing, right when I graduated, uh, a very famous professor from Cornell went there, needed somebody with that knowledge. And so I got my foot in the door there as a postdoc, moved on to a staff person, started teaching um, at the time, and it just went from there. But I, I will say, by the way, I learned a lot of what I do now um, uh, once I got out in the working field. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That is true. Yeah. That is true. That's a wonderful story. Uh, when you and I were talking, I, you know, I said, it's good that they, you know, not everybody has the same path, right? Everybody has a, a story to tell, a journey to travel. And that, that is different for all of us. So, you know, so just because it, 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 it takes, it, it will take time when you get there. Uh, one, uh, two questions uh, on the chat, and we're going to go back to some of the science, uh, 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 Michiko. Are elements from particle acceleration used in cancer research? Are elements? Are elements from particle acceleration used in cancer research? I'm guessing that's whatever the, the, the you know, for example, the NASA radiation uh, lab used, you know, accelerated. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, th this isn't my particular area of expertise, but this is sort of how I understand it. So we uh, use these beams impinge them on a target, this is at the isotope production lab, and create new radioactive isotopes. So these isotopes uh, don't occur naturally in nature, so therefore we, they, uh, or if they do in such small abundance that uh, it's not useful, but we can make them in an abundance that's sufficiently high that they can then uh, be used. And, and what I have heard that, for example, that sometimes these radioisotopes will be in injected into uh, or somehow uh, introduced into a body mm -hmm. and through, through science that's beyond my expertise can migrate to a particular area of concern, for example, the thyroid. And uh, then as the radioactivity, as you have these decays, it deposits energy localized to where uh, you have like a tumor. Mm -hmm. And so the answer to that question is yes. 
we use these beams to generate these isotopes that are directly used. There's also a branch of building isotopes for, um, for as diagnostics. I'm not familiar enough really to go into that, but I know that our facility generates isotopes for both diagnostic, medical diagnostics and medical treatment. Yes, thank you. Then I know that some of that, because of the end type of energy, there's quite a, uh, they, some of them can be quite unique too. Um, there's another question here. Uh, what kind, what, what kind of spin of technologies have come from designing and building particle accelerators? What kind of technologies? What, what kind of spin off technologies? Spin offs, spin offs, yes. Um, one example that comes to mind uh, are power sources. So you need power sources to uh, generate uh, the high energies. So there's, um, uh, okay, how do I explain this? Uh, so to accelerate, let's take a very simple example of an electron. You have an electron that has a charge of uh, a negative charge. If you take two plates and put a positive voltage on this, it will get attracted. And that's the basic concept of a cavity. So you are uh, a cavity, except a cavity can also uh, um, be driven by a radio frequency field, which means that the uh, field is alternating from positive to negative, positive to negative. So depending on what time that accelerate that that beam is present, you can sort of accelerate even more. But the point is that the higher the voltages that are applied, the more acceleration you can get. So one technology that has, is a spinoff is uh, so-called klystrons, which can generate these high voltages that you use to accelerate the particles. And these klystrons, uh, it's now made by industry, uh, but they, were, they, they started, I believe, in the, um, it, or the interest was generated by our field, particle accelerators. But they're used, for example, to power the um, antennas the big antennas that you see on the hillsides for, for transmitting radio waves. So there's an example that's widespread. Another example is um, the handling of massive quantities and sending um, massive quantities of data around. So uh, at CERN, they like to claim that they, uh, they do. Uh, they built the, the first ever uh, World Wide Web. Mm -hmm. So it turns out that these colliding beam experiments in particular generate an enormous amount of data. I think at our mm -hmm. last time I looked, uh, we have, uh, and for those who are familiar with the units, petabytes of data. And, uh, being, and, and we actually ship that all over the world to scientists uh, to study. And so those huge quantities of data transfer, the, the technology that's behind that uh, did in fact lead to uh, so later commercialization and the ability to all uh, um, be online and uh, have the, the World Wide Web and Google and, and all these, yeah. all these um, uh, applications it's, that we now know and love. Mm -hmm. But you have to think about when did that happen? It was, you know, just in the last, even just 20 years ago, they didn't exist at all. But through the, the, like I say, through the um, technology development that went into developing particle accelerators, that spun off and um, has benefited almost, well. Everybody. Yeah, almost, I don't want to be Almost so everybody. Almost, goes, I was yeah, like, almost. So many, right. the majority yeah, yeah. of us in the United States, at least, mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, almost. That's, that's, so um, before we kind of pivot to, to your career path and continue that conversation, there's one more question that I want to ask. Can, can you go into more detail on how particle accelerators are used in COVID research? I, let me know if um, in COVID research. That has to do with the light source. I, the, uh, it's, research is really so new uh, that I can't say much about it, but I can talk about it maybe in generalities. Um, but it may be too general even. Well, I think it's, you know, they, they, they have used uh, the light source, um, you know, the x-rays to do structure, right? Find right? the structures yeah. on, on, on the proteins related to the virus. And also, you know, that you let the structure, you can figure out what kind of chemical, uh, what, what kind of small molecule, what kind of 
you know, exactly. you can use to either block the virus from infecting cells or you can block the virus from, you know, continuing its life cycle inside the cell and make it more of itself. So I think the, so some of the things that, that, that have come out of in the recent research, when you think about things like accelerators, like the light source, for example, mm -hmm. for example. Um, so I know uh, we are at about 4.35 time. So I want to go back to, to, to your, your path. So we, we, you, you, you mentioned that you did your, your um, you, you talk about your, your undergraduate and your graduate, or your graduate work and, and so forth. So if, if, if they are, for the high school students that, that are listening to us today or college students or any student for that matter, uh, what kind of preparation you, 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 you recommend that they have before applying to research programs? What kind of, uh, uh, should they do internship? What kind of, what kind of uh, courses should they be taking if they want to pursue a STEM career, for example, in the field, for, in physics, let's say? In our field, okay. Uh, well, turns out that uh, they're not, um, a lot of universities that actually are teaching accelerator physics. Mm -hmm. Cornell teaches, there's Texas A&M, there are two uh, master's degree programs that are affiliated with, with what's called the United States Particle Accelerator School. And that's a school that uh, is offered twice a year for two weeks at a time. And there is a master's program that goes along with that. Um, but generally to get started, it's good to have uh, to take, um, and this is probably more at the college level, um, electrodynamics, uh, also to have a good uh, sense of mechanics. Um, but there are a number of technologies that are needed uh, to operate an accelerator uh, that um, are a little bit more specific like um and and these are the ones that um it's hard to find courses in um vacuum technology um computing is a big one as well we have of course to control all these magnets and 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 cavities and synchronize them and all this we we have to have control systems um we need the um the hardware the power supplies uh that power the magnets uh, so there are a lot of a lot of um different technologies that go mm -hmm. together. Um, magnet design is a big one. At the Relativistic Avi-Ion Collider, I failed to mention this, but um, we op these are two superconducting um, rings, meaning that uh, the magnets, of which there are about 1800, they're operating at superconducting uh, at, at low, very, very, very low temperatures. So that's uh, cryogenic systems, liquid helium and so on. Um, there's also a, a huge amount of uh, beam diagnostics. So how, how do you uh, control the properties of the beams? Um, mm -hmm. So you need to, to have a good understanding of electrical engineering uh, for that. Actually, electrical engineering is uh, pervasive throughout accelerators in the power supplies, but also um, in the, uh, in the um, detectors um, to detect the properties of the beam, the position, you know, the loss, the current, how much current you have, how much charge you have. Yeah. Um, so you're looking at various level, not just, you know, there are, there's a role for engineers, for technicians, yes. for scientists at any kind of level of Absolutely. education. Absolutely. And, 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 and we have in our department uh, of scientists, professional staff, which consists of, of engineering, electronic engineering, electrical engineering, mechanical engineering. We have many, many, many technicians. Um, and, and we've got the instrumentation folks, we have the administrative staff, and within each of those areas, people at all levels. And I'd hasten to add that, that Brookhaven National Lab, if, if you don't know, offers various programs uh, already starting at the high school student level, mm -hmm. but also internship programs. And I believe that information is all accessible by the public on the web. So if you're interested in these things, you should certainly take a look at that. And uh, you know, hopefully you can apply. I believe it's rather competitive, but, um, but maybe you have a, a science that you'd like to pursue. Um, maybe not in accelerator physics, but in the applications even, and hopefully you can, um, you know, try to connect up with um, with a mentor and, and get into one of these uh, prestigious programs. I mean, that's, so, a, that's a great start. 
Yeah, what they say they to, all this. Yeah. You're applying for college or you've been working with Brookhaven. And I believe just from, uh, you know, through the friendships of my children, um, I, I hear a lot that, that, you know, people get all excited because they, their child got accepted as a high school student to work with a scientist here at Brookhaven or even an engineer. So there, there are a lot of people that uh, like to work with the public and there are avenues uh, with which to do so at Brookhaven. It's actually an extremely impressive uh, program. Yeah, as I said, we, I can, I, we, that maybe uh, Diana can put it in the chat. We have the Haskell Research Program, and then there is the Science Undergraduate Laboratory Internship for SULI um, that is funded uh, by the Department of Energy. And so that, I agree, those are great experiences as a student. Any student can start thinking, hey, this is something that I'm interested in. I'm going to try it, you know. And then in, maybe you, you, you're, you're part of that experience and find maybe I like this and that is okay too, right? And that is, that is, that is, that is okay too. So those are great opportunities for students to, to, um, to take advantage of, to, to, to take advantage of. How long have you been at, B, at BNL, um, Michiko? I've been at BNL for uh, about uh, 12 years now. Well, here. So you came from Germ from where before here? Right. You know the answer. <laughs> I went from Stanford after working there for many, many, many years, uh, for private reasons, for my uh, to be with my now husband. I went to Germany and worked at a a, a, a national lab there for how many years? Mm, eight years. But I took three years maternity leave. So I actually worked only for five years to mm -hmm. maternity leave. And then he actually came and did the te uh, technical design for this national synchrotron light source. And so I was lucky to come and also get a job on the other side of the campus. <laughs> <working> <laughs> with the ions. So he did the electrons, I did the ions. And now maybe people in the audience know we're going to merge the two and build, uh, we just got a, um, did a groundbreaking ceremony recently over the summer uh, for the future uh, latest, greatest uh, research instrument um, called the Electron Ion Collider. Mm -hmm. So we're going to merge and have one ring full of electrons, the other ring full of either protons or heavy ions, and we'll do research. And that will take us well into for the at least another 25 to 30 years worth of, of science. And a lot of many more uh, science, uh, and many more young blood, I should say, coming into the field as well. That's uh, right. There will be a lot of opportunities uh, in about. Right. Well, right now it's all kind of in the in the design stage. It requires quite a lot of uh, uh, years of experience to be doing this, but we will merge into the construction phase, and then, mm -hmm. then there are another whole sets of other problems. Uh, really good for engineering um, and the accelerator science as well, of course. <laughs> there is a question in the chat. It says, I'm currently an intern at Brookhaven. Do you have any advice for getting an internship in particle physics in Germany? Oh, I'm afraid I uh, cannot answer that. Okay. Um, yeah, I, uh, I, what I can say is uh, Germany, and at least from my experience of visiting, granted it's been a year or so since I've been anywhere overseas, but my experience is that in Europe, there um, the, the number of, of young folks mm -hmm. is extremely high. So I think that there, there must be a lot of um, uh, like entry level programs uh, mm -hmm. that they're promoting. Mm -hmm. I think one would have to, again, probably look at their websites and, and, and look and, uh, you know, my recommendation is if they have a program and if something is there interesting to you, don't just go through the, the formal uh, application process, yes. but reach out to the people that are doing the science that interest you. Yes. That will help your case. It will move it along. So that's mm -hmm. my advice. I, no, I used to do that back in my days when I was looking for my postdoc. That's how I did it. Yeah. Check people out. Um, I, so we have reached our time. I, it, it was a great conversation, Michiko. You know, I, I hope that we can do it again because we have so much to talk about, about BNL uh, history in, in the field and what have you not. Any, any last words of advice that you want to say to our audience before we tune off? 
Well, uh, I guess it would be about physics in general. Uh, mm -hmm. To just keep an open mind and, you know, when you see something and don't understand how it works, hopefully that sparks your interest and you say, I want to know how that works and you just dive in and research until you find, uh, find the answers and, you know, work with others along the way to get there and it's very rewarding. Ms. Chico, I'm sorry, I just missed one question, one question before we go. Will okay. Columbia University contribute to a field like this? Pardon? Will Columbia University? Columbia, yes. Yes, um, I couldn't name all the uh, the uh, uh, universities that are affiliated with Brookhaven National Lab, but there are a number of universities, and Columbia is one of them. Thank you, Ms. Chico. Yeah, so in our in our very high level management boards, we've got representatives from Columbia, Yale, and others. I couldn't mention them all right now. Thank you. I just didn't want to leave without answering that question to our listener. Thank you, Ms. Chico, for joining us today. So that's the time we have. Again, I would like to say thank you to Michiko. We appreciate uh, what you know, you're sharing, your, your life experience, the, the, on the, the knowledge, the science of accelerators and the insights of, of the field. Our next Science Thursday is December 17 um, at four o'clock. Uh, we'd like to thank Brookhaven National Laboratory for hosting this event today and encourage you to check our programs, uh, research and internship opportunities and available virtual contact at the websites that have been uh, listed or shown in the chat section. And also remember, you can always follow us on social media. Please stay safe. Please wear your mask and have a, a great holiday time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Bye. <laughs>